Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. Now, we're thinking about the actual text. Right? We're thinking about the words of God. And we're talking about the meaning and understanding of the text. And that's to, so what does this tell us about that, about the actual text? <coughs> All right, let's, let's break it down. So, does anybody know when about the book of Deuteronomy was written? Who, who wrote the book of Deuteronomy? Moses. Moses. Now, when was it? When did he write it down? Roughly. In the wilderness. Yeah, during the wilderness, right? Probably just after Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments, because it only took them a couple of weeks. Uh, is that too long? Yeah, I think just under two weeks to get from the crossing of the Red Sea to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, and then there were 40 years in the wilderness, right? Now, they were fleeing the Egyptians and getting to Mount Sinai. You probably didn't write it then. It's a bit hard to keep writing on the back of a camel or something, you know. So, um, it was probably written after they went to Mount Sinai. So, and they, does anybody know when they actually got into the Promised Land, when Joshua actually crossed over Jordan? Do your maths. If they left Israel about uh, Egypt about 1446, and they spent 40 years in the wilderness. 1496. Wrong way. Oh, 1406. Yeah, 1406 BC, right? So this was written during that time, as was the rest of the Pentateuch, the rest of the first five books of the Bible, the rest of the Torah. And Moses died just before they went into the Promised Land. So he probably didn't do a lot of writing off that. <laughs> Just so, right? Okay. Now, who was this written to? People of Israel. Yeah, the people of Israel, the whole of Israel. Okay, now what was the purpose? It tells you right at the beginning. What's the purpose that this, this is written? Obedience to God. Yes. But if you obey the Lord, it will bring you blessings and happiness. Yeah. And what did the people have to do to ensure that happened? It's in there in the text. That they would um, keep God's word in their heart and in, in their entire, sorry, entire life. Yeah. Keep the words. Look at verse like 9. Without season, basically the same. Yeah, teaching them. See, it says, ah, you shall yeah. teach them your children. Now look at the next bit. Speaking of them when thou sittest down in thine house, when thou walkest by the way. So they're teaching this by? By the verbal communication. By communication, by reading it out aloud. Okay? That's why we've got the dog up there. You'll see in just a second. Okay? Now, the implications are very interesting. So we've talked about those first couple of things, right? Now, look at the implications. The first five books of Moses was learned verbatim. That's what it says here. It says the words. It was learned verbatim by word every word. You learn it by heart. You understand? Now, it was a large population, okay? Lots of estimates, a few hundred thousand up to two million. Don't get into that now. But there's this huge population and they're together and they're all doing this. Every day, when they're sitting down, when they're standing up, when they're on the move even, it says. They're doing this. Now they're insulated 
population. They're not having interaction with the people who are for 40 years wandering in the desert doing this. Now, do you understand that that means that every jot and tittle, word and phrase inspired by God would be known verbatim by heart, but it was read and pronounced without error by this population of native speakers. Question, what did they then sound like when they read the words? They would have all sounded the same. You get a bunch of Kiwis in the room, do they have a Kiwi accent? Yes. Nobody notices it because you're saying the same. Deb says yes, what does that tell you about Deb? <laughs> She's not a Kiwi. So she notices the difference. But when a group of people are together all speaking the same words with the same accent, they all know the one and only pronunciation. Okay? <laughs> right. Now, let me explain this a step further. So when a rabbi taught his student or a father his son to read the Torah, as we've just been talking about, they would also be teaching the way the words were pronounced. It's like when you say to your child when you're learning how to read, say dog. Everybody says dog. Even though he does not know how it's spelt, he does know how it's pronounced. He doesn't pronounce it dog or dig or anything like that. He repeats the way it's pronounced to them. Does that make sense? So if you've got a small group that's isolated, that works. Everybody's going to be saying and pronouncing the name of God and every other word exactly the same for 40 years. Wherever you go in that camp, in that uh, sojourn through the wilderness, you might go and stay over at your great aunt Martha's, it'll be pronounced exactly the same way. You get the idea? So this is critical. So the Jewish scribes, as they settled in the land, and then there was history happening, the diaspora and that, where people got separated and other people were coming in, they recognised the dwindling native speakers of Biblical Hebrew was becoming a problem. So they wanted to preserve this proper pronunciation of Biblical Hebrew. So around the 6th century AD, the Masorites were commissioned to develop what became as Likud, that's those vowel points we talked about, to place them above and below the text, never changing the text itself. So that's the Masoretic text. Now, in 900 AD, that text was accepted immediately and university, universally in every Jewish community, family, household in the world. And it has been ever since without exception. This is important. This means that the pronunciation that the vowel points prescribe was the same pronunciation that everybody had been using for 2,000 years. If they'd suddenly changed the pronunciation, who would know? Everybody. It's like when I say to you guys, you know that nursery rhyme? Jock and Pill went up the hill. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong? It's Jack and Jill. You know that, don't you? Why? Well, it was a young <laughs> yeah, you've heard it as a young person. Everybody's heard the same pronunciation. That's what I'm saying. This is what we're talking about. And this has been happening for 2,000 years. Therefore, the Masoretic pronunciation of every word in the Tanakh, that's the Old Testament, the Torah's first five books, the Tanakh is the whole thing, was and is correct. It's almost impossible to learn any language, but it's almost impossible to read the Tanakh in Hebrew without the vowel points. You don't know what you're saying. <coughs> now, 
At first, the oldest script that we had of the Old Testament um, in existence was the um, Torah, <coughs> excuse me, the Tanakh from 926. And we knew that from then it hadn't changed. The Hebrew text was based on earlier texts, but up until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you couldn't prove that it hadn't changed. Now with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we went from 926 AD to about 200 BC. You with me? We're going back in time. And now we could say that the Masoretic text had not ever changed from over 100 BC up until the present, 2000. So in over 2000 years, there were no changes. I, I found this was, before I got saved, I thought this was incredible. I couldn't work it out. How could you have a text being copied by so many people over so many years? Surely it must have been changed. But the Dead Sea Scrolls proved that it didn't. Okay? If you want to get into a very precise discussion about that, I love it. We can talk about that. Okay. Now, very important. Think about the implications. Do you understand that the only difference, we looked at this before, between the Masoretic text and the Tanakh scrolls are those little vowel points that we looked at? Entered by the Masorites and accepted by every Jew for over a thousand years when it was written. Now, it's a lot longer than that, obviously. And they give the correct pronunciation of every word. You get that now from what we said this morning. So now we come to our question. Please interrupt. We're going to say, is it Yahweh or Jehovah? We're finally going to get there. But we can't muck about with it. So, the King James, when they translated this into English, they looked at the Masoretic text. It's what they used. But they made a decision that they would, because of what Jesus said about not using the name of Jehovah or Yahweh, they made a decision that they would only, because it's never in the New Testament, we said that, but in the Old Testament they would only use it when it was specific to the name. Okay? So we can look this up. We've got a few minutes. Exodus 6 3. It's a personal name. Um, somebody would go there, please. Um, Psalm 83 18, Isaiah 22 2, and Isaiah. 26 four. Let's have a look at those, please. Call it out when you get there. Just read it out. Just like sword drum. Exodus 6, 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, Abraham, unto mm. Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah, for I not known to him. A specific name. Psalm 8, 83, 18. That men may know that thou, whose name is name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Right. 1812, uh, Isaiah 12, 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song, and he also is become my salvation. Thank you. Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Okay, so it's when his name is specific. It's actually saying this is his name. And they said it's Jehovah. Now, we don't know if they're right yet. That's the next step. Right, and it's the same in, um, in these two scriptures. It's talking about a place name, and it says Jah Jehovah. And then when it's a personal name as part of a place like Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom, they're, lo they're locations, they're place names, okay? But they're a specific name. That's the important thing. So, were the translators correct? Now, this is where we talked about common sense. We've said the Masoretic text never changed. It wasn't allowed to change. 
it would have been pointed out if something had gone wrong. People would not have stood for it. What they got was what they asked for. Now, if I say to you, please write a letter, you write the letter for me, I look at it, I don't receive it unless it's what I ask for. And remember, they're down to every jot and tilt. So going back to this, we've got to know that the only difference between the text of the vowel points, there's the metaretic ones, they are the same in everything, they are the vowel points. Even people who disagree with what I'm going to say about whether it's Yahweh or Jehovah have to admit that these are the vowel points. There is no option. There is no other. Okay? So now we're going to get into, we're going to teach you how to pronounce Hebrew. I didn't bring my stick. So your letters, that's in Y. You've got to go from right to left. Uh, yod he vav he yod he vav he there are your letters y h v h if you're german dutch or hebrew if you're <coughs> english you would say j h w h that's pronunciation like johan and john do you see the difference j johan j john it's not a different letter it's a pronunciation so you've got to get Y or E or A. Switch it round because you want to go from left to right. Yehua. If you actually want to pronounce it the way the Jews said it, Yehua. And if you're German, Dutch, Ukraine, I think, because of the J and the W, that's where you'd stop. So you're saying Yehua. Is that clear? And because we're English, we say Jehovah. Now, it's got to be that, because there are three syllables. You go Besheva, okay? <coughs> the column and the command to your vowels, <coughs> they are in between the letters. So it's Y, E, H O V A H. You've got three syllables. You can't say Yahweh because you've just missed out a whole syllable. You can't do it. It's got to be Jehovah or Yahuwah. That makes sense? There's just no way you can do it. Um, here's your pronunciation of your vowels. You can check it across. It's just basic Hebrew spelling. Now, there may be some people who disagree with me. And you will get modern translations that put in Yahweh. I'm going to say this and I'm going to upset people. Here's the proof they don't know what they're doing. Are you ready? Because I think common sense. It's not just the name of God. It's just not place names in the Bible. It's every single word that you have, like names, Jehoiakim, Jehoram, Jehoras, Jehoshaphat. They use the same vowels in the same place. They are compound names built on Jehovah. You can't just change Jehovah to Yahweh and say, aren't I clever? You're going to have to change every word in the entire Masoretic text that uses those vowels. I had this at Bible College, by the way. And my professor, Dr. Robbins, 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 Robinson, Robinson, this is, he's virtually fluent in Hebrew. And we had to, he said, no, it's Yahweh. And I went through this with him and he goes, well, if you put it like that, yeah. I said, but hang on. You, why, show me where I'm wrong. You know? You'd have to change everything. Yeah. That's why it's got to be Jehovah, why the Masoretic text says Jehovah, and it's why the King James did it the way they did it. 
It's, it's as simple as that, or as complicated as that. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord Jehovah. That is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. This is a covenantal name of God. It is a strictly personal, relational name to the people who belong to the covenant. That's why he says in the text, this is a name that I gave to no other people. These people did not know my name, he said to Abraham. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Joseph and this is my name to my people. That's how important this is. Like a friend of mine, all his girlfriends were named Jules. His first one was Julie and he used to call her Jules and when he broke up and got another girlfriend, he still called her Jules and she got upset and said, no, no, it's because you're my precious Jewel. So he called all of his girlfriends Jules. <laughs> this is the opposite. This is, this is my name, I will give it to no other. Simple. Everyone understand now why this is Jehovah? But here's the thing we must always remember. Please. Under the new covenant, Jesus never used the name. The disciples, the apostles, never used the name. Because our relationship is different. When you pray, pray our Father. So as Christians, we address God according to Jesus, according to the apostles and that, as Father. He is the one true God, so when we declare him to others, we talk about the God. We talk about the Father, the God, the Lord. And I just thought the scripture I want to share, I've got to find it now, because I didn't, it just popped into my head. It's in John. Um, pretty sure it's in John. It's when um, Thomas, somebody get there first, please. When Thomas talks to, Jesus appears to him and says, put your hand in my side. Um, 2027. So? 2027. 2027, that sounds good. Would you like to read it out to me? What does he say to him? Uh, then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And what does he say? What does Thomas say? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. See, my kurios in hotheos. My kurios, my God. He's declaring that Jesus is this God. He's declaring that Jesus is Jehovah. Even Jesus' name means Jehovah's salvation. Right? This is why it's so important. But even in this precious moment, the name Jehovah isn't used. In the Greek, as I said, it's, there's no such word as Jehovah um, in the Greek. So they say... Um, Kurios for Lord and Theos for God. So in answer to the question that we started off with, I, I we can discuss it, we can talk, but this is what we're here for, talk about it. But if the Masoretic text is correct, and our Bible is correct, well, I'm not really worried about the English translation, but I do believe the King James is absolutely right. But if the Masoretic text is right, it's got to be Jehovah. And I'll say that again. 
There is no Bible in existence that doesn't use the Masoretic text. It's all we've got. Even when they modify it by using the Septuagint or the Latin Vulgate, do you know what they do? They don't change the Masoretic text and they never change the name of God. They don't do that. They just tweak all the rest of it. So you finish up with things like, you know, David killed Goliath, but in many translations, somebody else killed him. I'm not being funny, it's actually there. Because they left out the vowel conjunction in the Masoretic text. Now, I'm not trying to dictate to you or to tell you, this is what I've discovered and what I've learned. Please feel free. Please. Questions, discussions. Come on, we've got a couple of minutes. <coughs> if you went up to a rabbi and said, oh, your God's called Jehovah, what would he tell you? Depends which rabbi you spoke to. Now, most authorised rabbis mm -hmm. would get a wry smile on their face and just go, sure. Or they'll turn around and say something which is a more Jewish thing, as you say. Mm. Okay, so what are they thinking, mate? Mm. Doesn't tell you what's going on upstairs. No. Most of them, most... Uh, you've got Orthodox Jews, uh, Conservative Jews, right? You've got a wide spectrum of Jews. Most of them won't pronounce the name. They, will, they won't even pronounce it as Jehovah. They won't pronounce it anyway. They will talk about the one. They will talk about the creator. And sometimes they will say God. And if you ever see that written in a Jewish thing, they leave out the O. They go G space D. I don't know what. If you go to a um, Karaite Jew, not a problem. Well, they'll say, no, no, it's not Jehovah. They'll say Yehovah because they're using the Jewish pronunciation, of course, you know. So that's what you'll get, okay? And then you might get somebody like the comedian I knew, who turned around and said to me, no, oh, your New Testament gives you his name, it's Harold. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So the answer is, most rabbis would just say, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, if you get a more liberal one, they'll get into a discussion. As soon as a, a rabbi turns around and says to you, we don't know, you know that he's liberal. Because okay. every rabbi knows that they know everything. Okay? <laughs> mm. Um, who would I suggest? If you're on YouTube, rab be careful because he does not like Christians and he hates the New Testament, but he knows it backwards. His name is Rabbi Torvi, T-O-V-I. The man's incredible. What he knows, especially about the Old Testament and everything, he's just brilliant. But he's sarcastic, rude, and all the other things that make rabbis great. <laughs> T-O-B-I. Rabbi Torbett. Well, okay. <clears throat> was this, whether you agree or not, was it clear as we went through it how I've arrived at this position? Okay. Now, I would urge you to be Bereans, right? Check arguments and check what I've said. But just because somebody else says something, something different, you always have to ask the next question, why? And have they actually answered, sorry, answered, the points that I've laid out? Have they actually dealt with what I've said? Okay. <coughs> Don't 
don't normally do. Who got something out of this study? That's good. Yeah. Is it helpful? Yes. Yeah. Renato, did it answer your question? <coughs> yeah. 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 Go back and listen to the rest of it this morning. Yeah? Oh, when you get a chance, listen to this morning, yeah? Alright, so tell me, uh, after the break, we'll come back, we're looking at Jason's question about dispensationalism. Um, that might take towards the end of the year. I've got about six or eight weeks laid out, okay? But think about, have you got anything else you want to look at? It's your study, it's not mine. And we can try and make this journey together and get you guys to think and to ask questions. Okay, I don't pretend to know, but I will try to find out. Okay. Would somebody like to close some prayer, please? <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for for the work that was done on the cross and for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your work um, that we done on this uh, study and that um, um, he gave us uh, that information to deliver and that uh, we know you a little bit uh, better now and help us to grow and uh, also help us to go through this morning service. Uh, uh, you, uh, we came here to glorify you together, Lord, and and thank you for um, everyone who, who are here and help Ian to prepare the next um, the next uh, subject. And thank you for all the blessings that we have in Jesus' precious name. We pray in Amen. Amen. And thank you guys for, for the topics we've 